Good morning, everyone. Um, well, I've been allocated something like 45 minutes for the talk and some questions and answers. So uh, uh, I've titled the talk, Six Short Stories, Things You Might or Might Not Know About Architecture at the University of Toronto. So after some overview, introductory comments, it's going to be about five minutes per story, something like that. Um, well, it's very nice to be invited to give this talk. Um, the guidebook, this book on the University of Toronto, um, it's like a lot of little projects. It turned very rapidly into a very large project. It was about five years ago that uh, Princeton Architectural Press and the university got together. That meeting included Reevee. Can you believe five years? It was, it was 2005, about five years ago. And we had a kind of brainstorming session, a question, a, a kind of what if we did a comprehensive guidebook on all the architecture on University of Toronto's three campuses, its main campus and the two suburban campuses. And uh, so it took about two years to organize everything, get the contracts in place, and then it took me about two years to do the research and writing. And the book came out a year ago, came out uh, in the spring of 2009. Now, um, the, just to give you a little sense of the context of this guidebook, uh, the U of T guidebook, I always forget, it's 200 and give or take, it's about 260 pages. It's one of now 20 guidebooks on campuses uh, in the United States and Canada. One of the things we were very excited about when Princeton Architectural Press came to talk with us is that they had already done 19 guidebooks in the series, and I'm just showing you a few, uh, just a few here. But you can see we thought we were going to be in pretty good company. This is not a bad crowd to be in, you know? <laughs> and I'm just showing you nine out of the 20 that had been done before University of Toronto. Um, it was the first guidebook for Princeton Architectural Press outside the United States. All the campuses that they had done were in the US. So again, we were very honored that uh, they won their first book in Canada was going to be on U of T. Uh, since the U of T book, they're now working on guidebooks for uh, Cambridge and Oxford in the UK. So um, it was daunting for me to sort of uh, jump into this research project and be part of this rather nice, uh, rather nice crowd. So they have a a template, a sort of standardized approach, and as you'll see in a moment, the guidebook is organized into a series of, um, into a series of walks. Well, people have asked me, you know, why did you want to do this? Why did you want to spend two years of your life doing this guidebook? Because uh, in the end, it's not really about making money or anything like that. It was like, for me, uh, an exciting proposition because I knew kind of selfishly I was going to get to look at 170 buildings. And for an architect, uh, even the mediocre ones, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, it was a kind of exciting idea. It also meant that for me it was an opportunity to learn about and piece together the very complex history of the U of T uh, campuses. This is a bird's eye view. I know it's a little hard to see from back at the back, but this is a bird's eye view of uh, Toronto as some artists imagined it in about 1878. So somebody's up in a balloons, gondolas, <laughs> looking down. Right? Uh, but it's a wonderful view. I think now with Toronto becoming this very glassy, high-rise city, uh, to, to look at it, the, the lake shore with all the piers and docks, the smokestacks, the kind of industrial city. Here you get Spadina, Spadina Circle. And then towards the upper right, that 
green forest, which is, of course, the U of T campus. And you see kind of in the middle of that forest a big uh, structure, which is, of course, university, university college. So you have to kind of think back uh, the early 1800s, uh, to be more precise, 1828, when the university purchased 150 acres of forest land very much on the edge of the city. So forests, cow pastures, and not too far away, beautiful, beautiful hills. Um, so, you know, not a whole lot happened between 1828 and 1878 if, when this view was made, but a few buildings were constructed, and I'll talk about some of those uh, in a moment. Um, of course, the official founding of U University of Toronto was, um, was 1850. But the point here is that it was um, uh, so interesting to think about this uh, campus starting out sort of in the forest, in the pasture fields, on the edge of, uh, of York, later to become Toronto, and, uh, and what it is today. This highly urbanized university where, in some ways, the city of Toronto and the campus, they really merge, they overlap. Um, we're like, more like, uh, say, NYU and those, you know, other urban campuses. Uh, uh, and this, some people find this view a bit disorienting. They have to think, like, where is this? So this is the dome of Convocation Hall. <laughs> So you're looking southeast. This photograph's a few years old, so today you'd see even more uh, high-rise towers. But it shows MedSci, the uh, CCBR research uh, building. But it shows the kind of uh, urban density um, and uh, very modern characteristics that uh, uh, are, are so much a part of our character now. So it's a long ways from those early pasture fields to what we are now. But at the same time that we're this very dense urban campus, we've been able to preserve these beautiful courtyards and open spaces. And I'm going to read just from time to time a paragraph from the book. The city of Toronto is densely built and in its collective mindset overtly modernist. It has also become a city of towers with scores of residential high-rise structures surrounding the University of Toronto's downtown St. George campus. In this context, the university's central historic campus with its substantial masonry buildings, courtyards, lawns, playing fields, and mature trees is not only distinctive, but increasingly of great value as a network of open public spaces. Here we find an oasis of calm amidst, amidst metropolitan fervor. So I think increasingly we really value the campus as this kind of uh, great park and uh, place that's open to the public uh, in the center of a very dense city. Well, um, I spent, of course, a lot of time in the University of Toronto archives. Uh, we have marvelous archives here, and I just can't say enough about the wonderful people that uh, are guardians of our history and all the important documents, including uh, this wonderful photograph. On the left, Vincent Massey. On the right, uh, President Claude Bissell. Uh, Claude Bissell was president from 58 to 71. And uh, in this photograph from 1963, they are uh, hovering over and discussing the architectural model for Massey College. And of course, Massey College is one of our really uh, masterful works of architecture here on, here on the campus. But the, the archives is just full of, of wonderful uh, documents of our architectural uh, history and heritage. As I mentioned, uh, Princeton Architectural Press provides a template, uh, a kind of an, a standardized approach to each of the guidebooks, but each university is able to kind of adjust it 
to its own particular circumstances. So um, we ended up with a foreword by uh, George Baird, who was um, followed me as dean of the Faculty of Architecture. Uh, an extensive introduction by Martin Friedland, who is the university historian and who has written a very, very important and fine book about the history of the university. And then, um, very simply, nine walks. Six walks on the main campus, then Scarborough, Mississauga, and a final walk uh, that deals with uh, buildings that surround the, the downtown campus. Each of the walks begins with a, um, with a map, a diagram of the precinct uh, of the walk, uh, a list of the buildings, and then very simply each building is keyed into the map. Princeton Architectural Press has this guy who just makes these fabulous, fabulous maps. Uh, so, for example, the first story that I will present to you is um, about Cumberland House. So, here's St. <coughs> George, here's College, and here's Cumberland House. So, it's made to be a very useful book. You can literally walk around, okay, I'm going to do walk one, I want to see building number 18. Uh, it's, it's a very, hopefully, very practical guide. First story. Cumberland House. Now, I picked these six stories because, you know, I could tell a hundred stories, <laughs> but these are favorites of mine. How many of you know Cumberland House? Yeah, at least half of you. It's, uh, you know, it's a place you can walk by on St. George and maybe if you're kind of rushing along or staring down at the sidewalk, you can not notice it. It's set behind a lovely iron fence. It's a kind of beautiful yard. And it's, it's a, a very um, important work of architecture that was completed in 1860. Why is it called Cumberland House? Well, this is why the story is so interesting. This is Fred Frederick, or he's known as Fred Cumberland. And this is a cover of a book by Jeffrey Simmons um, about Fred Cumberland, who was a very a uh, prominent architect in Toronto. He was also um, a civil engineer, a railway manager, and eventually a politician. Frederick Cumberland was the co-architect with William Storm of University College. Now you all, I think almost all of you, I'm sure, know University College. It's our iconic, one of our great buildings on campus. So Cumberland and Storm, very prominent architectural firm, they get the commission to do University College, which is completed in 1859. In 1860, Fred Cumberland, who was 37 years old, uh, builds this house for his family. So you can kind of piece together the puzzle. He must have gotten a very nice commission as the architect to do University College. St. George at the time was becoming a prestigious street to live on, so he built this little urban villa, not so little, uh, for his family, having just finished university college. Now, the interesting thing is, if you look at a map, you realize that Fred Cumberland could get up in the morning in the second story bedroom and look across the pasture field over the sheep and see University College sort of through the trees at that time. It's not possible today, but it was possible then. And uh, again, very hard to see, but if you study this bird's eye view, you can find in the forest along St. George um, Cumberland's house. And um, upper left is a, is a diagram, uh, um, elevational study, and then some other projects of the same period by, uh, by Cumberland. It is now the, international, the house, International Students House. Um, University of Toronto acquired the property in, um, I think, 1906, let's see. No, University of Toronto purchased the house in 1921. So it was used for law, business, and other purposes until 1961. Be, uh, 
when it became uh, International Student House. And it's generally been taken good care of. The interior has some beautiful rooms, fireplaces, handsome stairways, and so on. But some of the surroundings need a little, little perking up. There's like kind of asphalt parking lots around part of it that I hope will be replaced soon. But it's a, it's a really, really wonderful piece of our, um, of our history and an interesting story about Fred Cumberland, the architect who, had, who designed this for his family. Second story, St. Basil's Church at St. Michael's College, 1856. Now, the Sharp students in this little class will remember that, what year did I say University College was finished? Oh, really good students. 1859. So what does this tell you, everybody who thought University College was the oldest building on campus? No. This is the oldest building. Um, finished three years before University College. I love this artist's view of what somebody thought St. Basil's and its compound, com uh, grouping of buildings uh, in, a, in a Gothic style uh, was going to look like. This was the vision, uh, this uh, drawing etchings from 1855. So it was, I don't know the exact sequence here, of the, of, but it w was just before the building was uh, uh, built. But, you know, basically this piece, a version of this piece was realized, but not the whole cloister and not the whole ensemble. But again, it's such a marvelous thing to, to look at and to think about what Toronto was, uh, was like in the middle of the 19th century. Well, like a lot of kind of master plan visions, uh, St. Michael's, uh, their campus architecture didn't unfold quite as tidily as this coherent vision. Um, here's St. Basil's, uh, one of the great landmarks in the city. <coughs> on a place called Clover Hill. So you, again, have to remember, think about these pasture fields and uh, uh, this estate called Clover Hill that was um, owned by a man named Captain John Emsley. And in 1853, Captain Emsley donated four lots to the Basilican Fathers, and then later they purchased a few more lots to create a new parish church. If you go to the St. Mike's campus, there's a lovely little one block long street with beautiful houses that have been restored. It's called Emsley Place, and that's named for Captain John Emsley, who originally owned the estate, who gave the land for St. Basil's. Some people referred to Emsley Place, that little grouping of about eight houses, as um, the first subdivision in Toronto. Mm -hmm. there's, another, there's another whole story there. Anyway, uh, so St. Michael's, uh, again, somebody could write an, another whole book about the architecture <laughs> there because there's been an attempt to relate as time goes on, to do buildings of their time, but in materials and styles that relate to the original uh, 1856 building. So, for example, uh, a very kind of understated but very fine work of architecture, Carr Hall, which was completed in 1954, and surprisingly for a lot of people to discover that it was designed by Ernest Carmier. Ernest Carmier uh, designed the Supreme Court building, Can Canadian Supreme Court building, but also an amazing, and the U University of Montreal's main buildings, and also Ernest Cormier designed an astonishing house for himself in Montreal, which, when Trudeau st uh, stepped down as prime minister, purchased, and uh, all his final years from from retirement and until his passing, uh, Trudeau lived in an amazing house by Ernest Cormier. So we have, it's rather understated, but actually a very um, uh, elegant work of architecture that through its uh, stone and detailing and so on, um, attempts rather successfully to, to relate to the original buildings. 
more recent attempts to um, uh, kind of uh, <coughs> relate, I think, are somewhat less successful. Um, for example, um, uh, this project from, let's see, I don't remember the date exactly right now, but a few, a few years ago, uh, which is a dormitory right adjacent uh, to St. Basil's, which is done in a kind of pseudo-historicist style, maybe trying too hard to mimic the original um, architecture. Sam Sabara Hall, 2001, not one of my favorites. But this story gets more complex because St. Mike sold off a large chunk of its property. University of Toronto and its affili affiliated colleges. We all struggle with <coughs> budgets. It gets to be very tough sometimes. And so one can be very critical, but anyway, St. Mike's uh, sold off a piece of its property, got a fair amount of money that it needed, and sold it to a developer. And these two towers are going up as we speak right next to St. Basil's. I'm not thrilled about it. So I'll read you my final uh, piece in the entry on, uh, on St. Basil's. So I, I, having gone through some of its architectural history, I say, despite this topsy-turvy history, St. Basil's has miraculous, miraculous, miraculously survived and remains as a beautiful, solemn place of worship in Toronto's downtown. After he died in 1863, Captain John Emsley's body was buried in St. Michael's Cathedral, but his heart was buried separately, per his request, in the west wall of St. Basil's, marked by a white marble plaque. One must wonder what he would make of the continuing and complex sequence of building up and tearing down that has gone on for more than 150 years on his beloved Clover Hill. So, you know, these, so many of these stories, like the architecture and construction, it's a continuous process. It, it, it is constantly, it seems, about uh, building up, tearing down, and then building up again. So it's so interesting to go from here to there and back again. Third story, and I need to speed up a little bit. Mechanical engineering, 1948, just very soon after World War II. And one of the kind of sleeper works of architecture on this campus, most people don't pay a whole lot of attention, has sort of, you know, ugly air conditioners sticking out and things like that. But this building by um, Allward and Goinlock from 1948 is a very significant piece of architecture in what we might generally term the international style. It's much more complex than that. It's actually a kind of intersection of influences from the German Bauhaus in the 1920s. International style, very kind of pared down, but also influences from the Dutch to style movement of the early 1920s. Um, and it's Amazing that the university finally built this very uh, early modern building because in 1909, Darling and Pearson had done the thermodynamics building just around the corner off King's College Road. It's an exquisite, exquisite building from 1909 with these beautiful, I mean, the brickwork is absolutely gorgeous. And Darling and Pearson had proposed that uh, there was going to be a whole additional wing of this project along what is now King's College Road. So you have to think back to um, 1909 when the thermodynamics was finally realized. Why didn't the other wing of this get built and in this style in 1909? Budget cuts. The budget, they, Darling and Pearson ran into budget problems and the university couldn't um, and had a budget crunch and couldn't realize the other wing. So 1909, 1910, they decided, can't do it, we're gonna delay it a little while. Well, the delay was 35 years. <laughs> and finally, of course, the world had changed, architecture had changed, and they built this, which is a long ways from Darling and Pearson. 
this is an earlier black and white photo. Um, but in general, the building has, uh, the integrity of the building has been maintained, and I'm hopeful that maybe soon the university will find the money to restore the windows, uh, of course, do the kind of energy upgrades that the building needs, and get rid of those nasty uh, air conditioners poking out of the windows. But uh, uh, have a look at that building sometime. Um, the, the, this main volume with the clock that miraculously still works. <laughs> it's, a, it's a great piece of early modernism. Um, fourth story, Scarborough and Arendale. And there's an interesting interlock here. Um, Scarborough College was founded in 64, Arendale in 65. Of course, now this is known as University of Toronto Scarborough, UTSC, and Arendale is now UTM, University of Toronto Mississauga. But they were founded a year apart, and these dates simply represent how long it took to realize the first building. So founded 64, they used temporary buildings until the first building, and similarly here. Well, the story here is really a story, no, not about sheep. <laughs> <laughs> you notice I keep talking about sheep and cows. And I grew up on a farm. Um, so here's the architect, uh, John Andrews. John Andrews did the very famous first building at Scarborough, Scarborough College, the big, brutalist, concrete, sprawling, amazing building. John Andrews was Australian. He was a finalist in the Toronto City Hall competition. He didn't win, but he had studied at Harvard, and he liked Toronto, and his scheme was one of the runners up for the Toronto City Hall competition in the late 50s. And he decided to stay in Toronto, and he got a teaching position at U of T. He was chair of architecture for several years. And he was given the commission to design Scarborough College. Now, why do I have all the sheep here? Because, I'll tell you why. Because John Andrews was born in 1933, but he retired a few years ago, went back to Australia, and he's a sheep farmer now. <laughs> so John Andrews did Scarborough College, that I'll show you in a moment. Other famous works by him include the CN Tower from the 1970s and the School of Architecture at Harvard, which is called uh, Gund, uh, Gund Hall. Uh, CN Tower, 1973, Gund Hall, 1972. Both of these coming a few years after Scarborough College. Well, here's a kind of classic view uh, before the campus started expanding so rapidly. So uh, it was a conception about a complete urban village. It was a conception to deal with the harsh Canadian climate. There are interior streets. Uh, it's almost like an Italian hill town. And it was very intelligent. It also um, uh, held back the, the bank. It helped stop erosion. Um, it, it was environmentally very, very advanced for its time. But it was also a tough environment. A lot of exposed concrete. You saw the other projects by John Andrews. He loved to work with exposed concrete. So you get these interior spaces that are very dramatic, very monumental, beautiful lighting. But uh, some students and faculty and members of that community have found the, the concrete to be rather harsh. So there have been attempts in recent years to sort of ameliorate that. But it is a very uh, significant work of architecture that people from all over the world came to see. And uh, along with Expo 67, the Habitat in Montreal, mm -hmm. It's probably one of the two or three most famous Canadian buildings uh, uh, worldwide. Well, the interesting story that I discovered poking around in the archives is that just as Scarborough College is getting finished in 66, uh, <coughs> Arendelle is starting, and the planning committee says, gee, we like what Andrew's doing at Scarborough. This is so exciting, and we want Andrews to do Arendelle College also. So John Andrews prepared a complete master plan, a complete design. Uh, the University of, Library, uh, University of Toronto Library has the document. Um, 
that Andrews, John Andrews did for a complete vision, and this is a little bit later rendering, a complete kind of what we would call a megastructure for Arendelle. Now, you look at it now and some of you are going, oh my God, you know, it's like, looks like an airport or looks like a, an office uh, park or something like that. But it was uh, very much of the time, um, all the dormitories and classrooms, everything was all integrated. Well, a bit like Michael's call it, St. Michael's, uh, St. Basil's, where the original vision wasn't realized, uh, only about that piece got built. That's all that got built out of the project. Andrews, by the 70s, left and went back to Australia, and this project was carried forward by an engineering firm called uh, A.D. Margison, and also by Raymond Moriyama. Um, Raymond Moriyama, one of Toronto's most prominent and, and highly regarded architects, uh, finally designed what's called Phase One. And this, of course, is a photograph of Phase One at uh, Arendelle. One little tiny piece of what was going to be this vast megastructure. Well, um, I'd love to talk with John Andrews about all this someday, but I guess I have to get a plane ticket to Australia first. Fifth story, graduate house. Here it is. Another controversial building on, the, on our campus. Um, I love this photograph by Tom Arbon. Uh, Princeton Architectural Press commissioned a young Toronto photographer, a graduate of U of T, to do 95% uh, of the photographs for the book. Some of the photographs are, of course, black and white archival. But the press wanted a very consistent kind of uh, uh, viewpoint. This is a great, uh, I think, a, a wonderful picture. This was a design competition in the late 90s. U of T wanted to build more student housing and identified a number of sites. And they had to put something like 450 students on, graduate students on a very compact site. And the city was very aggressive about saying, well, you can only build so high, you can only have a certain kind of density, you have to have an interior courtyard and so on. It was a very tough project. And at the same time, the university said, well, we want some kind of western gateway into the campus. How can you make this building like a gateway? So the architect, Tom Main, devised this big cornice-like piece, which is a corridor and a sign and simultaneously cantilevers over Harvard to provide a gateway uh, from the west. Well, um, it's, it is um, uh, a kind of tough, uh, industrial-looking building in many ways, but uh, exciting at the same time. It's a dramatic building. As you know, it has the final big O cantilevered off the uh, end. And here's the primary architect, Tom Main. He's based in Los Angeles. And last year, he won the most important award in architecture internationally, the Pritzker Prize. It is the Nobel Prize of architecture. And Tom Main won that. Uh, not for Graduate House, but for his whole body of work, which includes, uh, I thought I would show, the Caltrans building in Los Angeles. This is a Los Angeles transportation, sort of like our um, uh, TTC um, equivalent, and he did their headquarters building. And what's so interesting, again, you can sort of see as a sort of first cousin of Graduate House. This was done two years after Graduate House. Um, it has a kind of uh, staccato, jazz-like facade, these dramatic cantilevers, the big pop graphics, the scrim screens, and so on. So, of course, he's working in a very, you know, consistent way. The other co-architect was Toronto architect Stephen Teeple, who did this very beautiful <coughs> little um, uh, daycare center just behind um, Graduate House on Glen Morris. So these two architects, the LA architect, the Toronto architect, they had a very compatible vision that led to Graduate House. 
So my last view here of Graduate House, I, I love this picture by Tom Arban as well. A surprising picture which catch, captures all of the kind of uh, complexity and hustle bustle of the streets to the west and the Victorian texture. And then Graduate House, sort of like floating like a super liner across there. And then your favorite building in the background, <laughs> Robarts. And, then, and then all of you are thinking, oh, what, is he, what is he going to say about Robarts? Well, you have to buy the book. <laughs> Final story, the Leslie L. Dan Pharmacy Building from 2006, uh, one of our more recent um, and very interesting additions to the campus. Again, a tough site, a really small site. Pharmacy needed a lot of new space. The province had decided to produce more pharmacists. We're all getting older. We're all concerned. We all have, uh, we all need more pharmacists, it seems. Um, and they had to pack all of this onto a very tight site. The building's actually like three cubes. You have to imagine this upper office and research cube, a kind of atrium public area with the floating pods. And then what you don't see is below ground another whole cube of space that has huge uh, auditoria underground. Because like an auditorium, you don't really need windows, so those things could go underground. So the architects really made this extremely vertical uh, uh, composition just to get a lot of space um, to meet the space requirements. Well, it's dramatic at night. It has this computer program theatrical lighting that plays on the pods. So at this important intersection at Queens Park, you get a kind of dramatic light show at night. And the architect was Norman Foster. Uh, Norman Foster, along with Frank Gehry, uh, are arguably the two ma most uh, famous, <laughs> most accomplished architects in the world uh, right now. Frank Gehry, of course, did the extension to the Art Gallery of Ontario. <coughs> uh, Bill Bow, uh, Museum, um, Disney Hall, and so on. But Norman Foster is maybe even a bit more, well, as famous or more famous than Frank Gehry. Norman Foster is based in London, and two of his earlier projects uh, uh, include the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, a very uh, amazing building in uh, the central part of Hong Kong, and uh, this uh, office building in London, affectionately known as the Gherkin. <laughs> uh, Norman Foster also did the Hong Kong airport, the new Beijing airport. He has an enormous office, a uh, big, huge staff with projects all over the world. So for him doing... Um, the, uh, for his office to do pharmacy uh, it was a very small project for them, but I think it was a bit of a coup for U of T to, uh, uh, to be able to have Norman Foster do it. He's so intelligent because here's the 1931 very fine Georgian Tans building that faces Queens Park. It's a beautiful Georgian structure from 1931, neo-Georgian. So, uh, you know, in this kind of exaggerated view, you see the columns of uh, the concrete columns of, of uh, the pharmacy building, but it captures almost its classical, um, its classical sense. And my final paragraph that I will read to you uh, is about the pharmacy building. Two wonderfully mysterious ovoid forms float above a coffee shop and seating area in the grand lobby. These pods, which seem to defy gravity, were constructed as steel baskets and suspended by steel rods. They contain seminar rooms and have student and faculty lounges carved into their tops. At night, computer programmed lighting bounces off the pods and the lobby's soaring glass walls, presenting a theatrical display for passersby. The Leslie L. Dan Pharmacy Building's generosity of scale and overall aesthetic clarity enable it to play a significant role 
at the juncture of University Avenue and College Street. Its stately concrete columns and elegant fritted glass cladding relate well to the materials employed in the Ontario Hydro Building to the south. Now this is a bit funny when I say this, but with the completion in 2010 of the 23-story glass-clad West Tower of the Mars Center diagonally opposite, <laughs> the pharmacy building will participate in an even grander urban composition at this key Toronto intersection. Well, that's the odd thing about writing books. You write a book, you finish the manuscript, a year later the book comes out. Little did I know there would be a crashing recession that uh, brought the Mars Tower to a screeching halt. So at the moment, uh, it does not have its uh, first cousin di uh, diagonally. Well, uh, to conclude with the cover, where after great to and fro and arguments about what we would put on the cover, uh, we put Hart House, which is this very fine collegiate Gothic building that really belongs to everybody. I mean, Hart House is sort of the building that represents the Toronto community in many ways, in some ways even more so than University College. And it's a really fine collegiate Gothic building. So it went on the cover, even though I wanted that on the cover. <laughs> Princeton Architectural Press prevailed. Uh, uh, this, of course, is a kind of very eccentric view with the of the pharmacy atrium with the photographer literally on his back, uh, shooting upwards, uh, looking upwards. And um, uh, I think it would have been a very dramatic cover. But um, in the end, I think Princeton Architectural Press probably made a good decision. Because finally, one has to look at the university and its architecture over many, many decades. and. Um, Life goes on, architecture goes on. So let's imagine this book 20 years from now. Uh, which one are we going to be more sure about as a kind of uh, representation of the university? You know, maybe in 20 years, maybe this would have been fun for a while, but this one will, this, this will last. Hard House will last. Thank you very much.